to Living Ideas. I am delighted to have Lucy Bevan here today. Um, it has been, uh, you know, discovering Jack Banksep's work was a big turning point for me because I found for the first time a way of grounding emotions in science. And Lucy co-authored uh, the book with Jack Banksep, uh, The Archaeology of the Mind. So welcome, Lucy. Hey. So Lucy, how did you get interested in psychology? Oh, I got interested in psychology, just, just a kind of a penchant for it. I, at the time, you know, which was, you know, way back when, back in the day, um, psychology was more artsy. It wasn't so sciencey. Uh, one of the things I found out since I've trained, you know, many years ago, is it's not scientific enough for me. And so that's one of the reasons why I got interested in neuroscience. That's because it because it's scientifically grounded. You were telling me the story of your first discovery of uh, how you found neuroscience to be particularly useful. So can yeah. You tell people about that. Yeah, it was about 25 years ago. I was involved in a, a, a custody case where a mother a woman had given birth to a baby and uh, with it, and she had agreed to a private adoption within a day or two she'd given the baby up it was taken into the home of custodial parents and the birth mother changed her mind immediately she and the adoption wasn't final she wanted the baby back the father wanted the baby back and the custodial parents wouldn't comply so this dragged on in the courts for two and a half years and and eventually it was the supreme court that uh, ruled in favor of the biological parents, but it was a foregone conclusion, apparently, the lawyer told me. So everybody thought, well, this is going to be terrible. The child doesn't know these people, and so she's going to be torn apart. And um, anyway, we had a protocol that we could follow that was uh, was designed by Joyce Robertson and her husband, James Robertson, in, in London years ago. And what happened was she met with the custodial parents, with the uh, um, with her birth parents, a couple of times a week for a few hours, always in the presence of the uh, of the custodial parents who introduced them as family friends. I I was there, and by the end of a couple of weeks, she regarded her parents like a favorite aunt and uncle, and it was also clear, even though I stayed in the background, that I was a familiar, safe person. She could have come home with me, and. Um, Anyway, she did beautifully, just beautifully. Her vocabulary increased, no problem with toilet training. She ate well, she drank well, her vocabulary. And in time, she called her parents, mommy and daddy, and everything was fine. So everything in psychoanalysis said this should have been a disaster, and nobody believed it worked out. Nobody believed it. They thought it was a lie. So, But I visited a few times, and I knew it had. So... Um, that was when I turned to neuroscience, and I found basically two two uh, pieces of evidence, two areas of evidence. One has to do with the the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the Greek word for seahorse, and this little little structure embedded in the temporal lobe, lobe looks like a seahorse. They call it the hippocampus, and it's responsible for the creation of long term memories. And long term memories involves um, genetic changes, and the hippocampus cannot accomplish that until a child as it starts. It starts up at about when you're about four years old. So this child was two and a half, so her, her, she couldn't remember her mother. She couldn't remember her custodial parents. That Those uh, memories disappeared. That you say, but we know perfectly well from other studies that you can be harmed by infantile experiences that you can't remember. So how do you have unremembered harm? How does that work? Well, it works in three basic ways that I can describe very quickly. One has to do with the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system causes a great deal of, uh, it affects the uh, adrenal glands as a production of cortisol um, that, um, that will suppress the immune system. It has all sorts of other very deleterious effects on on the brain and, and, and so on. I won't go into them all. The other is the HPA, the um, axis. Now the HP axis also has a host of deleterious effects, psychological, physical, if it's prolonged. And then the other thing has to do with endogenous opioids and opioids are opiate-like 
chemicals that the brain makes and they make you feel good. And when you, and when there's a suppression of those endogenous opioids, you're miserable and you're, you're lonely and unhappy. Now it turns out that separations from a mother when there's no surrogate care, all three of these, SN, the sympathetic nervous system, the HPA axis and endogenous opioids all have very deleterious effects. But if a child has an opportunity to get to know somebody and feels comfortable with them and then goes into their care, all those things remain okay. And that's, that's basically why she did okay. So here I had psychoanalysis, which gave an absolutely incorrect um, prediction and, and a perfect explanation from neuroscience. <laughs> wow. wow, wonderful. So when did you come across the work of uh, Jack uh, Bankstep? Yeah, yeah Banks. That's okay. I, I, it was the year 2000, I can tell you exactly. Mark Soames, who's uh, the editor of the... Um, of, uh, neuropsychoanalysis journal, and, and it's also a society or something. Anyway, he's a very brilliant uh, uh, South African uh, psychoanalyst and neuroscience scientist, brilliant guy. And um, he, he had the first neuroscience psychoanalysis conference in London, and I lived there at the time. And I'd been reading about um, neuroscience for seven or eight years, and I, I got really into it. I, main thing, I tell you, I was just surprised I could understand it, frankly. But it isn't conceptually difficult. Um, a little bit of patience, anybody can understand it. And um, But I wasn't finding what I wanted about affects. I, you see, they divide affects and emotion. Emotion is purely physiological. Influx of stress, chemicals, behavioral, uh, visceral changes, that's emotion, it's physical. Affects, this thing that go along with it. Nobody knows how they're created, mm -hmm. even now, even now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I wasn't finding what I wanted and I was about to give up. And, and then Mark had this uh, conference in, in London and I went along to it and it was, it was great. I mean, Damasio was there, a guy named Doug Watt, who was a very good lecturer. There was some other guy there and then Yak was there. And I'm, I was sitting there and I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. He showed a bunch of pictures of animals in various states of affective arousal. And he was talking about, he was talking about some thing that wasn't cognitive. And I remember thinking to myself, I think this is a guy. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I met him. I, and I went up, I went up and I shook his hand, he didn't know who the hell I was. Mm -hmm. But I, I read his book and I outlined it and it, which was a very long process. And I didn't understand some things, so I emailed him, and um, he he emailed back. And then he came to England to do a lecture tour, and I was head of the department at at the uh, at the branch of the National Health where I work. And I invited him to come and speak, and we got to know each other then. And I and he said he wanted to write a popular book, and I said, "Well, you want some help?" That was it. Wow! Wow! So. What do you think is unique about his approach to emotions? I mean, you know, you, we have had emotions for a long time. People have been thinking about emotions, talking about emotions incessantly across history. How is his approach, Jack Panksepp's approach different than the traditional approach to emotion? Well, I would say it's more systematic. Um, he, he's, he did a lot of the research himself, um, but he took a lot from other people as well. And what he did was he said, no, I, I, I need to know about emotional systems. And, and I want to know what are the structures, what are the chemicals that fuel them? You know, I'm serious about it. I don't want to speak metaphorically because other people do. Now, the one thing that he didn't, he has, a, he has a hypothesis about it, which I could tell you briefly at some stage if you want to hear it. Um, he doesn't know how affects are created. Nobody does. Because it's, you, once you talk about affects, you're in the mind-body problem. Because you say, how does this physical lump of flesh between our ears make us feel lonely or, or happy or curious or anything? How does that happen? And... <laughs> He has, he has a sort of mechanistic idea, but um, nobody knows if it's right. Sure. We, we'll, we'll come to that at the end because, I, you know, the way I see it, uh, you know, the re reason I was completely blown away by his work is that 
it is very integrative first firstly first point is that i find that whenever there is a complex problem if somebody figures out exactly the axis along which to act, attack it it sometimes just solves itself and i think that's one thing that he's done by choosing to study mammals he's able to kind of look through all kinds of mammals use leverage all kinds of experimentation um and saying okay what is it that is common what systems emotional systems are common to all mammals and the second thing i like about him is that he uses everything so he uses neuroanatomy he uses neurochemistry he uses behavior he uses affects uh, in whatever way he can measure it and he tries to kind of correlate all of these things together so it's a much more stabler conclusions um so what i was thinking of doing is that we will come to affect and his concept of self but first let's discuss the emotions because uh, those uh, seven circuits because that's really rock solid i think yeah. um so so what are the emotional systems in mammals okay i'm see if i can remember them all cuz i always leave one out <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, the one is, the one that's the most important because it plays a part in everything else is what he calls the seeking system mm-hmm. uh i should just say just by way of preface i i think you hit on something about yak which is he has had just this incisive kind of intuition he could just see see a common pattern the reason why um or he he studied animals is because below the level of the neocortex which is the cognitive perceptual part of the brain all mammals are virtually the same yes so they're there in everybody in in everything <laughs> all all mammals and in a lot of other vertebrates and he thinks he thought also in invertebrates i don't know about that i mm-hmm. i don't know enough to say anything about it um but the seeking system is uh basically it's the proactive engagement with the world and what's interesting about it is that it isn't just a kind of a urge to do things it's there's a quality of euphoria a quality of 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 uh, agency in other words i can make this happen you could say it's the opposite of attachment the attachment you want to depend on somebody this is you want to do it mm-hmm. get out of my way let me do it and um it's also very importantly there's a willingness to take risks extremely mm-hmm. important part of it because without risks none of us would get anything done so that's that's the most important one Let, let's uh, let's uh, discuss them in detail each of them so the thing that really uh, i found most interesting about the seeking system is that what the way he describes is that there is a state like a basically a positive state then you see something that you want and it goes down it becomes negative and while you're pursuing it it remains negative and when you get it it comes back to the same level so it's like the the wanting is actually making it go down and then when you don't have it it is there at a lower level and then it's coming back to the same level does that um i mean that i found very interesting that it's it's something that uh you know it's like a the barrage are you talking about the barrage uh, uh, research uh, can barrages research uh, no i think uh, i think this is what i got from uh, one of jack's paper i don't know which one but <laughs> how, how how would you describe the the seeking so the seeking uh, where would it be involved i i didn't catch that last bit uh, where would uh, what kind of pursuits what kind of um activity anything you want Uh, if you know you see a you see a, a man or a woman you know depending on which gender you are who you're interested in that that mm-hmm. if you're hungry and there's something you want to eat that but uh, the thing is that it keeps um it keeps people and animals engaged even when they don't have what they want that's the, that's the whole point in other words if if um you know if you're working on a project just say something like that and you want to finish this thing and you want to hammer it out and get it right mm-hmm. you're going to just keep going 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 and it might be frustrating for you at certain times but this will keep you going and it's very very important for people to get anything accomplished animals if you disable the seeking system which you can do by just knocking out uh, dopamine receptors you can have an animal that's starving to death and you can put its favorite food beside it and it won't eat 
All right, let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Let, let, let me do one thing. Uh, what is the structure of this? Is there like an evolutionary structure of what what are kind of earlier parts of the emotions? Yeah. Later parts? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jak explains that the brain uh, evolved from the bottom up and from a medial to lateral uh, areas. So it's basically subcortical and midline cortical areas. The most important part of the, of the seeking system is the ventral teg tegmental area, the VTA, and then it goes up to parts of the hypothalamus and then to the nucleus accumbens. But I think that's gonna go, not gonna be very interesting to most people to hear those, those crummy, those arcane, uh, you know. Okay. Um, you no, I, what, what, I was, uh, what, what I was trying to get at is that there are these emotions, right? There is um, seeking, fear, uh, anger, uh, rage, yeah, yeah, rage, uh, lust, care, grief, play. You got them all. Okay, you give them to me one at a time because yes, so I'll do that. that. So okay. let's 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 talk about first fear. Uh, so the next two I'm going we're going to talk about is fear and rage because I also find the relationship very interesting. So let's. Uh, so what, what is fear? Uh, fear typically is physical injury and and uh, the prospect of death. It's it's but but it can be anything. You can be afraid of a tax audit, be afraid of a final exam, anything that promises to be an adverse thing. I mean, if you're afraid that your boyfriend doesn't like you anymore, you can be afraid about that. So um, anything bad. But in in the animal kingdom, physical danger. Yeah, and and it's the and basically, it's uh, fight or flight. In other words, if you're caught, I mean, you usually freeze in the hope of being overlooked, or else you run for your life. And if really cornered, then you'll fight. What are the neuro, uh, neuroanatomical or neurochemical concomitants of uh, fear? It's mainly um, it's mainly uh, uh, cortisol and and uh, and uh, what can you say? What's it? Why can't I think of it? Oh, anyway, the excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. Um, I, I don't have it at my fingertips. The I, I sh maybe I should have printed them out. Well, that's fine. But it, it's all it it those things I, I don't think are terribly memorable actually, sure. you know. But so they're what? there. But they exist. That's the point. Structures. And uh, the amygdala, the periaqueductal gray, portions of the periaqueductal gray, actually the periaqueductal gray, portions of it uh, participate in all the emotional systems. So you will see, like, for example, for there will be like a signature pattern sure. oh, yeah. for each of these emotions. And you could say, okay, for all mammals, this, these parts kind of light up. Absolutely. When, um, so let's compare fear and rage. What's the difference between fear and rage? Uh, rage is usually um, an encroachment. I'm, I imagine they overlap to some extent. Uh, obviously, if, if a bear takes your food, you know, you'll be annoyed, you'll be angry, but you're not going to make a fuss because mm -hmm. <laughs> you're never going to get killed. But if it's a squirrel, yeah, you'll, you'll pick up a bat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, it, but it's in, in, the, in the face of frustration or, or uh, an encroachment of some sort. And, and it, it, the one thing that's interesting about it is that psychoanalysts or many psychoanalysts think that uh, anger, rage, is a, aggression is an impulse and it makes you feel good. Uh, it doesn't actually. Animals, if you, if you electrically stimulate that part of the brain in a particular part of its cage, let's say, it will avoid that part of the cage. It doesn't like it. No. It's not a nice feeling. One of the interesting things about rage is that it requires... Um, target right yeah sure uh, sure I mean, it's not like a like you can have it's not a um kind of a generalized emotion it's like it always tries to seek a target like whenever you are angry well that you know yak would argue with you about that mm -hmm. in real life yeah sure i mean if if somebody steps ahead of me in in line when i'm in it, at the supermarket or something i'll tell them off i'll say you know wait your turn um, but what ya one of Yak's points is, is that you can, you can light up any one of these systems and nothing has to, nothing has to happen. 
in other words, you know, that those are the famous Walter Hess experiments where he, he zapped a part of a cat's brain and the cat would go out for an attack, you know, every single time, always for the head, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, the cat would, and, and, and Yak said, he, he did this once on a, a snake or something. I can't remember, but there was this huge plexiglass and he said, there was no way you could, you would avoid flinching when this thing came at you. He said, you, every time, didn't matter how, how many times he, he had experienced it. It was so, just so instinctive. So um, in real life, yeah, there has to be some sort of a, a reason, but um, not in terms of the way the brain functions. Yeah, no, I, that, that's another thing I found really interesting about uh, Jack's work is that, you know, there is like neuroanatomical things, neurochemical things, behavioral things, and affect. What he does is that he kind of systematically manipulates one of them. Like you put, uh, you know, you electrically stimulate uh, the ne neuro, uh, you know, neuroanatomical uh, structures. Then you introduce some chemical, you know, neurochemical, and each of them will have the same effect on the other things. <laughs> So I, well, it's in general, you can you can innovate a, a system either pharmacologically or electrically. That that is those are the two ways to do it. And one of the ways, I mean, he 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 uses both, and, but he also relies on behavioral things. Wonderful. Let's go to the next one. Um, lust, sexual urge. You know, it's um, how he, is that different from seeking? You can want anything. Okay. You can you can want you can want food you can want uh, you can want to find your child when when you can't when you when it's not mm -hmm. visible, um, and you can want sex you can want anything, so but lust is about sex, okay. you know it's it's in terms of in terms of kind of at a um, kind of neuroanatomical level, mm -hmm. is there a difference between lust and seeking in general? Yes, oh yes. Oh yeah, definitely. Now seeking will participate in lust. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're looking for a partner or looking for a mate, yeah, the seeking system will be active, but it will also be active, let's say when a mother is uh, feathering her nest, it, it'll, it, it's there with everything. So, but they, no, but they're definitely different. Yeah. Um, next one is care. Uh, care is the urge to nurture. It's, of course, typified by maternal love, by maternal ministrations. It's not limited to mothers, not limited to women. Mm -hmm. Just think of soldiers on a battlefield who sacrifice for each other. Think about, think about all the care workers in COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. if they, they sacrifice, sometimes, some of them sacrifice their lives, but they certainly sacrifice the possibility of getting sick and dying and particularly in the beginning, and they still did it. So it's, it's a very strong urge. And what's interesting about it is that it's, um, it's so contrary to, uh, to survival sometimes. Now, is this something that, is, uh, that comes in only at the mammalian level? So if you want to take like, um, let's compare like reptiles to mammals, mm. the seeking circuit, the fear circuit, rage circuit, lust circuit, would it um, would it be about the same in reptiles, or would it be different? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Well, in in um, fear and rage are very similar, um, and but uh, let's say the care system is doesn't really exist in reptiles, for the simple reason reptiles you know lay about a you know a couple of hundred eggs, and you know you're on your own, pal. You know, yeah. enough of you are going to make it to the sea, and the rest of you are going to be eaten by seagulls, mm -hmm. and and so they don't have to think about it in terms of, you know, just the crass horribleness of of, of evolution and survival of the of the fittest. Enough of them will survive, whereas um, mammals and uh, and and certain other vertebrates like birds and so on are born, you know, absolutely helpless, and they would all die without care. So um, it's, it's part of a mammalian vertebrate, um, uh, uh, you know, part of their inheritance, yeah. Perfect. Um, so basically the care is a later uh, kind of development, the, the care circuit, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, next one is grief. 
Uh, grief is a very interesting one. It's uh, it has to do again. It's only with social animals. It's it you wouldn't find it in reptiles. Mm -hmm. You know, a snake doesn't really care other than mating. It really doesn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it it's it's something that's very important because it's uh, it makes in you know newborns attached to the mother or attached to the parents who protect them. And basically speaking, in, in, in your life and in my life, uh, the grief system is, is sort of double-sided. On the one hand, if you are in the company of the people who love you, the people whom you love, the people who support you, you feel great. You're, there are lots of endogenous opioids in your brain. You feel terrific. You have a wonderful, joyful sense of belonging. If you're abandoned, if you're betrayed, if you're rejected, if you're um, defeated, uh, opioid levels plummet and you're miserable. And it's, it's a big source of depression. Now, um, the place where I actually understood this emotion the best was his example of a kitten, which was like, you know, when kitten is there and its mom leaves, you know, initially the kitten will cry out for the mom for a period of time. But if the mom does not come back, then it basically just curls up, mm. trying to conserve energy. Uh, and that entire kind of experience, um, I, I think that captures the kind of grief to me the best. Yes. Well, what he describes is that sort of grief descent into depression. Mm -hmm. At first, the grief is very, very keen and, and the, the, the urge for it to be reunited is, is extremely powerful. But I think when, when that doesn't happen, then you get the descent into, into depression. And, and, and that's one of the things that he describes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so basically, we have got this you know, the pair, uh, care and grief, that come at a mammalian level. And all of it has to do with the, um, the crucial importance of the social, socialness. In social, no, the social emotions. Perfect. Yeah. Um, Okay, now the emotion I find most interesting is the next one, that's play. Play, is yeah. Well, play is, I, I found it very interesting too because I, I just didn't expect it, you know. Um, they, now, they don't really understand too much about the play system, don't really understand the chemistry of it, don't really understand the neuroanatomy of it. But Yak is, was convinced that it exists for the following reason. He found that if you kept, let's say, Normally rats in, in laboratory rats begin to play at between the ages of I think 17 days and 25 days. That's when they start to play. Now, most animals, if you keep them isolated, uh, they, will, they will be depressed and miserable. But rats, laboratory rats in particular, have rather poorly developed care systems. So you can keep them isolated from the time of 15 days to 25 days. And then if you put them after that, in the company of another adolescent rat, the one that, that's been isolated will immediately engage in play, immediately. So it's not something that it's learned. So it seems to be instinctive. And he had a whole thing about rats laughing. I'm, I'm not sure I bought it ever, but <laughs> maybe he's right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, what is the role of play circuit in human beings? And that isn't entirely clear, certainly social hierarchies, because what play is, is it's a friendly, joyful sort of competition. So if, if two animals are playing, they'll have a great time together. But if one starts to, they usually start to play this way. One jumps on the back of the other one. Finally, one pins the other one briefly, and then they start all over again. So... Um, if, if you and I were bantering back and forth and let's say, you know, we knew each other really well and you and I were taking the mickey out of each other. Well, if we were just doing it back and forth and maybe you were doing it a little more to me than I was to you, we'd still be fine. But let's say you're just taking the piss out of me mm -hmm. over and over and I don't have any comeback. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it anymore. Yep. Similarly, when animals are, are doing those kinds of uh, play things, if one is always pinning the other and the other never gets a chance, they don't want to do it anymore. They, they walk away. So um, it's, it's, it's a sort of thing that's very 
it, it, it does establish certain hierarchies. Probably it develops skills. You think of a kitten playing with wool, probably teaches it how to catch mice, you know, better, things like that. But they're not exactly sure. But those things seem to figure in. Wonderful. Now, this is what I learned from uh, Yak's earlier book. Now, the thing about the, your joint collaboration with Yak, um, the book is trying to do something more than that. And say, okay, how do we use the understanding of these emotions uh, in psychotherapy, in, you know, how do we use this? So what- Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't think we did write a different book. I mean, Yak said he wanted to write a popular book and I said, let's do it together. And, but I don't think we did because I think it was just an update on the first book. So, and, and I, I have to, I, I'll admit to you that in, in some ways that was a disappointment to me because you see, I want to write a simple book, a book that would, wouldn't be quite so complicated. And I thought, well, if people would read this book, that are, you see, Yak, well, Yak wasn't really on the map the way he should have been. I'm, I, they had a, they had a special edition in Time Magazine about 15 years ago, and they were talking about the emotional brain. They didn't even include him in it. I was, I, I was outraged. I thought, and I, I wrote to me, and he didn't care. But, but um, it was, you know, he was not a good advertisement for himself. He, the things were too convoluted and too difficult, and, and, and that book is not easy to read. I wanted to write write one with him that would be easy to read. Then people could go to the other one. They'd have the outline so that they'd understand all the different permutations that he talked about. But he, he just couldn't do that. He just, he always got lost in the weeds. And, you know, so, I, so I, I kind of gave up. I mean, I wasn't going to argue with him about it. Uh, so Lucy, uh, suppose you wanted to apply these ideas. How do you see them as being applicable? How do you see that people can take these deep ideas and understand them in a form where they can actually use it in their life? Well, actually, I've, I've, <laughs> I've just finished a book that touches on some of that. I mean, it's, it's the book that I've written. It's been a little bit more the simple book that I'd had in mind to begin with, although I discussed some people other than Yak. But um, let me give you a few ways in, in which his taxonomy of the seven basic emotional system. There's two kinds of depression. One, uh, one emanates from the grief system, which is to say when you've been just what we were saying, when you've been abandoned or rejected or something like that, and you're losing hope that ever you're going to get a reunion and you descend into depression. Mm -hmm. That's one kind. That's a gnawing, miserable, you know, it's a wound that doesn't heal. The other kind of uh, depression comes from the seeking system. Now the seeking system gives you this energized urge to achieve, but when, when it winds down, which is to say when dopamine levels are too low, or, there's, nothing, there's nothing to work for. There's nothing to hope for. It's, it's hard to really decide which kind of depression is worse because it seems when there's absolutely no hope and you look forward to nothing, you can see it's just this gray, endless landscape in front of you. Wow. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've heard people describe that. I've heard both, both, both de described, and let's face it, almost all of us have felt the uh, grief kind of depression from one time or another. I mean, we've all had hard knocks. But um, so that's one thing. There's also two kinds of anxiety. One emanates from the grief system. When, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that got lost from his mother in a supermarket. Ouch. Particular kind of scream. Mm -hmm. It's unmistakable. Mm -hmm. It's terror, abject terror. It's completely different from the fear system. And furthermore, uh, there's every indication for reasons that I don't have time to tell you, that panic attacks are a manifestation of the grief system. Mm -hmm. Panic attacks are assuaged and made better by uh, antidepressants like amipramine. But if somebody is worried, let's say about surgery, upcoming surgery, amipramine doesn't help. Benzodiazepines help, you know, Valium, something like that. But for somebody who's having panic attack, Valium doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So 
they respond to different medications. So that's, that's, that's one thing. Another thing that um, we haven't talked about, um, you know, this is about Yak, but um, Joseph Ledoux, I don't know if you know too much about him. I mean, guys are great, guys brilliant. I mean, he's done some of the most brilliant experiments. It just, they blow your mind. And what, what he's done is he's done a lot of work on fear condition, um, fear conditioning. And he describes how basically how the brain makes free associations and why they're important for anybody who's doing psychotherapy. In other words, a patient will talk about this and this and this and this and all sorts of different things. And you're thinking, what do these things all have to do with each other? Well, Ledoux explains what happens is that all these different things, I, I, again, I'd love to go into the mechanism of it, but I don't have time and you probably wouldn't, nobody would remember it. Mm -hmm. But all these different things arouse the same emotion. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Say, take a little baby. A little baby is attached to its mother. That's an instinct. Mm -hmm. Likes the way she smells, likes the feel of her hair likes the texture of her clothing, likes her food, likes the sound of her voice, likes the smell of her perfume, all that kind of thing. Now you could say, what are these things? The tone of voice, texture of hair, clothing, all these, what do they have to do with each other? They're all so different. All associated, all have the same meaning, uh, which is the love of the mother. They all have the same associations. Ledoux describes in very mechanistic terms that are anybody can understand, how that's created. It's brilliant work. It's wonderful. He also describes why cure, psychotherapeutic cure is never complete. When you have, let's say you fear condition a, a rat to, you give it a shock to the foot and you play a, a auditory tone at the same time. Cup, you just need to pair that a couple of times the rat's scared of the tone for the rest of its life. You can, you can uh, extinguish the fear if you play the tone over and over and over and over many, many times with no shock. After a while, it's okay. But if the rat receives a shock at any time, it will start even without the tone, it will fear the tone again. If let's say you put it in the cage where you conditioned it, it will become afraid again. Let's say it was uh, conditioned, uh, let's say it was trained by some guy who wore a particular aftershave. If somebody else wears that aftershave, it might start again. What that tells you is that the, condi the conditioning circuitry, which made the rat afraid of the tone, persists. The other circuitry overrides it, but it doesn't extinguish it, doesn't kill it, doesn't kill it off. There is some atrophy that occurs over time, but it's not complete as far as we know. So people get better. People get a lot better, but during periods of stress, they, they can regress. And you know, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't be disappointed by that as a therapist. So Lucy, I did not know that you were writing a book. Tell me, tell me about the book. No, well, I just finished it about two weeks ago. Okay. I've only been working on it six years. <laughs> off and on, off and on. Please, please tell uh, us about the book. Well, I started to write it mainly to clarify things for myself. There's, there's three schools of thought about the way that affects are created. And they're all very different. And, and they're all very persuasive. I mean, Ledoux, for example, this brilliant guy has a idea which I, I think is totally wrong. I mean, it doesn't matter really. I mean, he's still brilliant, but I just don't think he's right about this. But um, so I was trying to clarify it for myself and um, my husband said that he sort of thought, he said, well, you might have a book there. And I thought, eh, well, you know, and, uh, and then, so I, I finally, I, I finally, I did, but, uh, but it was mainly, a, it started as self-help. It's, it, I'm not entirely sure about it. It's a little bit academic. Um, what is it called? Well, I haven't really, I'm not good at titles. I was thinking of, a shortcut to understanding uh, you see shortcut should be the main part of it you know affective uh, uh, to understanding affects or the neuroscience of affect i haven't figured out a title yet i'm no good maybe my daughter will help me 
So this is this is the book that you wanted to write with Yang. This well, similar. Okay. I wanted to write a book just about him, mm -hmm. but this book actually um, is wider. Okay. So apart from Yak and uh, Ladu, who else do you see as producing seminal work in in this field? Well, Damasio has. Okay. Um, Damasio's done a lot of really good work. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's got a number of things wrong, really wrong. Um, but the, um, Yak, I mean, but uh, even though Ledoux isn't really interested in affects, and you know, he he's he and he and Yak were, pretty, I mean, they were, I guess they got along all right, but they didn't like <laughs> like each other too much. They really disagreed, and every time, you know. You know, Ledoux would be talking and Yak would say, you know, God damn it. And, and Ledoux would say, you know, you always do this, Yak, you know. And, and, and they, were, they were sort of at loggerheads with each other. And, um, but I mean, I'm sorry, that brilliant work explains so much. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna look into it, it, it doesn't matter what he thought. I mean, mm -hmm. those are brilliant experiments and they tell you a hell of a lot about the way the mind works. So I think Ledoux is extremely important Although he might not like it that I think so. <laughs> uh, so. So Lucy, I would love for you to talk more about the book. Are you comfortable talking more about the book? Oh, sure. I don't mind. Okay. Tell me, tell me what, 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 what is, uh, tell me about the book. What, what, what does it try to do? How does it do it? Well, basically it, it's really trying to understand there's three schools of thought about how affects are created. Mm -hmm. One is Yak. One is Damasio, and the other is this, um, uh, it's this a theory, it's Lisa, her name is Lisa Feldman Barrett, and it's called the Conceptual Act Theory. Mm -hmm. And they're all very detailed, and, you know, and, you know, you read them, and, you, you know, it's, it's pretty persuasive. And you have to be, you see, you don't have to be a nerd like me. You have to be one of these people who's just been marinating in this for years and years and years and has just picked up all kinds of disparate things that you think, oh, wait a minute, I read this. And, you know, because if you just come to it new, you just wouldn't have that. You just need that context. Mm -hmm. So, which just because, just be, I don't know why, but just I have been marinating in it for mm -hmm. a very long time. So um, the main thing, and you know, the, the, the big argument against Yak is, he says animal behavior means that that's how they feel. And somebody like Ledoux comes along and says, says who? Did they tell you? It could be perfectly automatic behavior. How the hell do you know? And Yak jumps up and down and says, what do you think? Dogs don't feel anything? Do you think that, you know, how can you be that inhuman? And Ledoux says, I'm a scientist. I'm sorry, there's no evidence. And, and you know, on and on they go. And, and that was basically the extent of the argument. Mm -hmm. In other words, how could you be so sentimental or how could you be so inhuman? <laughs> you uh -huh. know, uh -huh. there really wasn't much more to it than that. So um, I kind of worked out an argument that pretty well, um, pretty well substantiates Yak's point of view because basically, oh, geez, I wonder if I could explain it. Basically what it has to do with is this. Um, you have animals will do certain things uh, for rewards. If you zap a per certain part of its brain, which turned out to be the seeking system, if you zap a certain part of the seek, if you zap the seeking system, an animal will will work very hard for that zap, and it will work to the point of absolute exhaustion. And it will even sometimes die. If you say to an animal, if you give an animal one one bit of food a day. And also at that very same time, give it an opportunity to zap the seeking system, it will ignore the food. So in other words, the reward isn't homeostatic. Mm -hmm. And without going into any more detail, it, since it's not homeostatic, what can it possibly be? It has to be an affective reward. So this is basically, so then you have, since these affective rewards emanate from subcortical brain systems, you could say, at least with the seeking system, you could say that means that other animals that 
zap that the seeking system, they're getting an affective reward because they're not getting a homeostatic one. So that's what they're getting. That means that subcortical portions of the brain are capable of experience or generating affects. And once you establish that, and you can establish it with a few other systems, that once you establish that capability, that goes a whole long way to really giving Yuck like the um, support that he needed. So it's on that basis that you can basically say, now he's the one who's right, and those other guys are not right. Wow, this, this, is, this is huge. Uh, kind of distinction between effective reward and homeostasis. That, that's amazing. Well, this is why this is what's wrong with Damasio. Damasio mm -hmm. links affects to homeostasis all the way. And he says, for example, that the goal of emotional behavior is to restore or or maintain or optimize homeostasis. In other words, if a bee flies around my head, I run I either I run away and then I feel better and I also avoid the bee sting. So that makes sense. But suppose um, suppose um, you have a mother animal who a, a predator is coming after her brood and she distracts it and maybe gets uh, puts herself in danger. That's, that's, that's emotional behavior that has nothing to do with maintenance of homeostasis. It's, it undermines homeostasis. Yes, yes. no, that's, that's amazing. That's a huge point. And especially with human beings it becomes bigger and bigger because the uh, the, the discrepancy between affective and homeostatic behavior is going to be much larger in, in human beings if it weren't there we wouldn't have any kind of society because all society requires altruism and self-sacrifice yes that's that's amazing um you said there were three theories uh three uh, approaches the last one was by Lisa, somebody? Lisa Felton Barrett. It's called the conceptual act theory. Mm -hmm. And um, well, basically what she says is there's, there are no emotional systems in the brain. Uh, there, you cannot localize a particular emotion, emotion to a particular part of the brain. And then she gives a whole lot of evidence supporting that. And basically in my book, I, oh, I'm sorry, I give a whole lot of evidence showing that that support that she offers isn't isn't uh, solid so um so uh, but basically the idea is this that we don't have any inherent emotions in other words we we learn them from other people in other words and she really says this that in some societies people are not frightened she she seems says that, that people don't experience fear that when they have the same emotion, they have the same physiology that you and I have when we're scared, but they don't feel frightened. Okay. And right. it's 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 pretty out there. Okay. All right. So after after uh, laying out these three schools of thought, mm -hmm. what do yeah. you do in your book? I'm sorry. After laying these three schools out, what do you do next? Well, then I I give an argument in favor of of Yak and yeah. his. Uh, his colleagues. And then I discuss um, Yock's hypothesis. It's a mechanistic hypothesis about the creation of, of uh, affects. And I give Damasio's. And, and basically, those are, those are real shortcuts because I can tell you, and I mean, it was murder getting, it was murder getting those down. Mm -hmm. So um, that was hell. <laughs> well, but but then, then I talk about um, certain ways that in, that this information can inform uh, uh, inform uh, psychotherapists and you know along you know two kinds of depression two kinds of anxiety how the brain creates uh, free association a, a little bit along the lines of what I was telling you about and then I discuss a couple of cases and how how I was helped by all this and you know and how I departed in, from certain traditional uh, ways of um, of um, you know, conducting psychotherapy. Wow. This, uh, Lucy, this is really fascinating. So, when does the book come out? Well, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't even found a publisher yet. I, I, um, I, I have to. I have to find a publisher. Okay. It's, it's kind of academic, so I don't know. You see, most most of the things kind of like the more, uh, uh, the more uh, clinical uh, approach, which 
this is, I mean, it has clinical stuff in it, but it isn't, it isn't mainly clinical. As I say, I wrote it for myself. Yes. No, no. I, I, I want to talk to you about it. I've, I've helped authors. I'm in publishing. Uh, I am. I'm a, I've been uh, an immigration law publisher for the past 20 years. And okay. uh, we've, I've worked with people in books on philosophy, economics, education, uh, various fields. So let's oh, maybe you can offer me some advice. Yeah, I'm not absolutely. particularly good on the business end of things. I would, I would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so this is fantastic. It's about an hour. So let's do one thing. Okay. Uh, let's give a chance for people to talk about these ideas amongst themselves. And then we will come back. Uh, give me just a second. Um, so uh, l- let me ask you one last question. Before sure. that, what was Jack like as a person and a person to work with? Um, Jack was brilliant. I mean, he was just so, oh, geez, so smart. I mean, really creative guy. I mean, I've, I've talked to very creative people in my life. Um, and and I, w- I asked him, I said, how did you think of that? Uh-huh. How did you think of that? How did that come to you? And he just sort of said, Mm, you know, <laughs> and I've, I've talked to other people. I know a guy who's a, a very, very talented painter. And I said, what? and he just, he just, and they don't have any idea. And so um, he wasn't easy to work with. He's, he was, um, he was, he could be a nitpicker. You know, he wasn't, now he wasn't easy to work with. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so, uh, but, but he was, he was very, bra- you know, he, he was so smart. I mean, you know, and, and he had this, as I say, he had this extraordinary intuition that was just informed of, by so, so many things and added and his creative mind. He was, he was incredible. Wow. Wow. Uh, wonderful. So I'm going to start the breakout rooms, folks. Uh, the breakout rooms will last for only about 20 minutes. Um, Lucy has put all this stuff on the table. Let's discuss this amongst ourselves. And then in 20 minutes, we'll come back automatically into this room. And then you will have a chance to talk about your takeaways very briefly, maybe about, um, you know, less than about a minute, minute and a half, something like that. Uh, And also ask a question. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, I'm starting the breakout rooms now. This is magic. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right, everybody's back. So, folks, it's uh, time for takeaways. Um, we have four rules, as always. Number one, in order to share your takeaway, you can share your takeaway and ask a question, or you can just share your takeaway or just ask a question. So, you got all the three options. Okay. Uh, we have four rules, as always. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to share your takeaway or ask a question. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. Rule number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. All right, so it's going to be Jennifer followed by Deborah next. Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I found this to be fascinating. And, and one of the questions that I raised was, that this is the, a question for Lucy. Um, uh, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about if, if there's any um, indication of grief in birds, because I had a pair of parakeets, the male lost his mate, and I swear he was depressed for a while. This conversation led us to talk about um, convergent evolution the um, altricial and percocial young in birds, and then also K and R reproductive strategies. And um, we had a bit of discussion around um, the megapodes, the birds that um, essentially just lay their eggs and then leave. The males actually come back to tend the nest to make sure that the temperature is correct. Um, so we had, we had a very lively discussion around, around birds and those topics. So my question would be, you know, what what has any study, have any studies been done on evidence of grieving in birds? Oh yeah, Yak did, Yak did. Okay. Um, uh, bird chicks, um, you know, uh, will, uh, if they're separated from their mothers, will cry. And, and one of the ways that he knew that, uh, let's say that endogenous opioids uh, 
played a big part is that if you infuse a little bit of just a just a tiny bit of an opiate inside the bird's brain it will stop crying close its eyes relax and go to sleep so definitely birds have uh, grief systems absolutely they do and i think what you observed in the bird that you you know your your bird was was absolutely correct Wonderful. Uh, so folks, uh, you can go ahead and uh, what we'll do is that I want to give chance for everybody to uh, take, share the takeaways and ask questions. So go ahead and give your takeaway and question and then Lucy will answer and then we'll go to the next person. Okay, no follow ups. So that way we can cover, uh, you know, get everybody as many people in as possible. Next up is going to be Deborah, Kevin, Jyoti, Judith and Wen Wen. Deborah, go ahead. Okay, so Lucy, so there were two things that you said that actually were kind of like validating for me, so I appreciate that. Um, when you talked about people freezing a lot, I realized that I do that, and people talk about fight or flight a lot, and I'm like, no, I'm just like paralyzed. Like, I don't know what to do. So knowing that that's not that uncommon was kind of nice. Also, what you were saying um, about panic attacks being like a manifestation of grief, but also the whole thing about like fear conditioning that, um, People can get better. I think that's how you said it, but that it's sort of an incomplete process. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like I've experienced that personally with anxiety where it's like people will say, oh, okay, just keep doing something. Basically just keep exposing yourself and it'll be fine. And they don't understand why if a few times I've done something and something hasn't happened, but if something negative has happened in the past that I'm still scared. Of it. So um, yeah. And knowing that like I can like revert because I've experienced that too like that that's like basically normal and that there's a biological basis for that. I just appreciate that. Like, I don't know if you would elaborate on that at all, but just, yeah, thank you. Cause that made me feel better about that. Okay. Well, the, the, uh, the conditioning experiments is, is just, I mean, they're so simple and it, it's a rat. A rat has, a rat is extremely unintelligent animal. And basically it's exposed to a tone and it's, it's a foot shock and, and, and then if you play the tone over and over and over and over again, it's after a while, it's, it doesn't ex ex exhibit fear. But, you know, human beings are so much more complex and we have so many more thoughts that are neurally connected to emotional systems that just simply exposing yourself to a, a noxious uh, an, uh, uh, a situation that you find frightening, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. I mean, I know that's what CBT people do, but uh, um, I've, I've heard a number of situations where it's it's really not been successful i'm not sure i'm quite answering your question though I'm... i think i think that's that's good i think i think uh, uh deborah do you want to follow up we generally don't do follow-ups but deborah uh, go ahead i'll make an exception oh just i mean i don't know if there's any like advice on this i'm sure i could look this up myself but just the idea that like if you have something negative that has happened to you and just exposing yourself to positive things, realizing, I mean, I don't know that like, it's not really a question, I guess it's more of a comment, realizing that like, it doesn't make it 100% better just because you've had some positive experiences after that, I guess. Yeah, that's, no, that's true, yeah. that's true. Uh, yeah, I, 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 one of the things I write about in the book, I treated a little boy who was very phobic about a lot of things. And he'd had a, when he was very little, he'd had a medical intervention, which scared the bejesus out of him. And, uh, and, Probably he'd been frightened throughout his childhood, but he was protected enough. But then when he got to be about nine, you know, kids play rougher then. And he, he just became phobic about everything. But because I knew about the, the fear system, because I, I knew I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but it can be, become sensitized. And because that ha can happen, I, I knew what was wrong with him. And I didn't just see fear as a, in the psychoanalytic way, as just a, you know, just a response to, instinctual edible things and stuff like that. So I was able to treat him much more easily, but I think it's important to understand maybe what it is that's frightened you, what it's about, how it's frightened you. And then, but then, yeah, one does have to sort of think about ways to overcome it, ways to deal with it, knowing that it may never be completely cured, but you can, it, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, a reason to, to feel downhearted. I think you can still do something about it. And that's that's what we do with everything. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, Jyoti, Judith, and Wen Wen. Kevin, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Lucy. And uh, actually, I grew up uh, from a village. So definitely, I experienced those uh, primary emotions from uh, a home-raised animal. 
a play, panic, grief, fear, rage, and seeking loved care. My question here, since let's see, we got a modern technology or whatever we developed so far, can we communicate with the animal? Can we read their information? We can better for ourselves. For example, 2008 hurricane, it, later on we find animal, they already earlier, they fly, they see during the cold day, they're going to fly across the sea. They already noticed that, that year, I, the, the birds fly early. So that's later on we find out that. That's one question I could be. And another one is, that animal has a normally own community. Can they try to talk to human, let's say, what they know about our world? And furthermore, can a mammal protest for themselves or nature? Thank you. Can, can mammals what? Uh, protest, let's see, I want to save my living environment, you know, or protect my uh, territory. Oh, can they protect? Okay. Yeah, protect, yeah. Uh, uh, well, protest or even further. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. You, you, you asked a lot of questions that I'm yeah. really not qualified to answer. I, I you know, I, I've, I've just focused so much on just, you know, trying to, the only thing I've been able to figure out is that affects emanate from uh, non-cognitive parts of the brain, largely from in and around the brainstem. Now you're you're talking about instinctual behavior like uh, migration and so on. I I just I just don't know about it. I I just don't know about it. I'm I'm. That's 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 fine, Lucy. Um, well, right. <laughs> You'd have to ask somebody who knows about that stuff. I just don't. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, uh, Judith, and Wenwen. Uh, if anybody else has. I uh, wants to share the takeaways and questions. Go ahead and uh, type exclamation mark. Uh, Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we were very fortunate to have Lucy in our breakout room. So most of my questions did get answered and I felt very normal. Thank you, uh, Lucy, for validating my feelings. <laughs> in will, will you do the same for me, please? <laughs> I sure will. You've done a great job. <laughs> and then that You got the best compliment in the world from me <laughs> you really did but my one question that was left before you were pulled away was does the lust and greed overlap um well yeah, to some extent greed can be part of the seeking system i mean you know, I mean, you know, if you're hungry, you'll go looking for food. Let's say talk about an animal. But of course, you and I know that, you know, the seeking system responds to greed as well as need. And that, you know, that extra piece of cake that, you know, you know, just that's just the usual thing where you don't need it at all and you're full, but you have it anyway. And, you know, you may kick yourself afterwards, but you still do it. So to that extent, uh, the seeking system can generate greed and, and, you know, if you're, you know, sexually, you know, really at it, I mean, it, it can, it can lead to, you know, uh, compulsive sexual behavior. Yeah, it can, but it can lead to compulsive of any kind of behavior, sexual, um, uh, as you, as we were saying, hoarding it, it, it. Am I answering you? Am I getting this right? Am I answering? Uh, Jyoti, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I mean, you're, uh, you're connecting the systems together. So lust and greed, one comes from the uh, seeking system and the other one, lust comes from the lust. Physio physiological and the... Sure. Well, it, it's, it's, in, it's in the brain. I mean, for example, uh, you know, if you, there's certain parts of the brain, I can't, I can't remember what they are now, but if you disable them, it'll have the, in a, in a male, it'll have the exact same result as castration. Oh. So, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously the sex happens in the body, it happens in the genitals, but, but it's, it's, but it, it's, uh, it's directed by the brain. Okay. So it could be related to greed, the person who has more 
need for everything when he is not satisfied he will just keep at it keep at it so yeah. that becomes a lust okay thank you Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Jyoti. Next up is going to be Judith, Wen Wen, and Shirley. Judith. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I would love yeah. it if you came back again. I want to say that. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, so you talked about two kinds of anxiety, and uh -huh. one was triggered by the grief system, and I missed what the other type was. Sure. Um, that's one question. The other question is... Um, you talked about fear circuits um, couldn't be um, could be overridden but not extinguished. Right. So I'm, but you also just um, talked about that um, the affective affects emanate from the non cognitive parts of the brain stem, right. like the brain stem. So I'm wondering how that fits with like the two year old. Like, would could could that um, could something uh, sensory stimulation trigger that sense of loss, um, like the scent of the mother before they were two um, at some time later, something like that. And finally, somebody in our um, group um, asked a question I really liked was, um, where does thinking fit yeah. in all of this and how does it fit? <laughs> okay, well, um, you've actually asked a lot there. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Um, now, uh, as far as can a sensory memory be triggered from two years old? Um, I don't know, nobody knows that. Um, uh, certainly, uh, certainly brain areas can be sensitized. For example, if you separate a, a little a rat pup from its mother for an extended period of time, uh, lots of different things will happen to its brains. It'll have fewer opioid uh, receptors, uh, which is to say it will be less easily comforted, and it will remain anxious into adulthood. So in other words, what I'm saying is that all kinds of damage can be done to an infantile brain. We don't understand that much about it. All I'm saying is it's not a memory. It's not a cognitive memory. It's not that. It's something different. So you say, now, how do, how do thoughts become involved? Well, it's, uh, Ledoux actually describes it very, very well. And it, it's, it's a very mechanistic process, basically, Let's say when, let's say, you know, you can, you can remove a cortex from a rat and still successfully condition it. Doesn't need to think about anything. But let's say you or I are conditioned, and let's say, let's say we're mugged on the street. Well, and let's say I notice a car going by, or I notice a certain person, or I notice this guy who's who's pulled a gun on me, or pulled it worse yet, pulled a knife on me, or something like that. I'll have all sorts of perceptions and all sorts of thoughts will be going through my head at the same time. And Ledoux describes a very mechanistic uh, 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 scientific explanation of how these things, how these thoughts all become connected to the same affective emotional system. So that's how thoughts get in, involved in it. It's, 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 it's basically you have a whole bunch of thoughts a whole bunch of ideas, and they all have the same emotional meaning or a very similar emotional meaning. And that's how they get connected. I, I don't know, does that answer you? Yes, thank you. And the, what's the other type of anxiety besides uh, grief? One is, one, is, one is from grief, which is, you know, basically I'm all alone, oh my God, what do I do now? And the other one is just fear. You know, you're afraid of something. You're afraid of something bad will happen to you. You know, you'll be hurt. You, you know, you'll be audited. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Wen Wen followed by Shirley. Wen Wen. Hi, um, I have a question about, um, you know, you said that about the, uh, the, the uh, localizing um, the emotions um, where, uh, which is uh, uh, lo uh, it's in the amygdala area. Um, but do you know, uh, amyg amyg amygdala seems to be a very small little tiny, look like tiny beans, it's just such a small area. Um, do you have um, more specific um, a mapping of, of uh, different emotions? Because uh, you have yeah. all different uh, desire, you know, greed and, and fears and all these different emotions inside the amygdala area. Uh, the how, how do you... Um, you know, stimulate or prohibit certain emotion if you are going to use this, um, you know. Well, the amygdala has, has got to be kind of a 
rock star status as a result of uh, Ledoux's experiments. And what Ledoux found out was that the amygdala plays an absolutely essential role in fear conditioning. And he describes it in a way that is extremely elegant. And those, those are the experiments that absolutely made his career. I mean, he's done other great experiments too, but these, these are really special. So the amygdala became known kind of as a center of emotion, which it isn't. It's this, it certainly participates in many emotions, fear being the main one. But if you want to talk about an, an emotional hub, it's probably the periaqueductal gray, which is located in the upper brainstem. And it has, its, its neurons are arranged in columns and each uh, a number of columns correspond to emotional systems. So if you want to talk about an emotional hub, it would be the periaqueductal gray. However, one of the things that Yak um, mapped out and one of the things that is just so great about his work is that he described that you have an, these emotion, seven emotional systems they are located, all of, them have, all of them have roots in the periaqueductal gray, but they concern other, other air, brain areas higher up, which he called, they're in the upper brain stem, and they're also in the limbic area, which is sort of between the cortex and the brain stem, and also in medial areas of the cortex. Those are the parts of the brain that developed first. And, um, and, and he maps them out. So you can see the amygdala is certainly very important, but it's not the only one. And the, and the idea the idea that the amygdala is somehow the emotional center, I don't know, it just kind of got just got into pop culture or something. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Shirley. Shirley, go okay. ahead. Okay. Okay. I want to thank both of you. It was very enlightening. And um, I wish you good luck on your book. Uh, you already answered my question on thinking. That was my question. Uh, but I wanted to know, did you ever hear of uh, Solansky, who was a neuroscientist and a primatologist, I believe? And he wrote the book Behave. Sapolsky, right? Yes, thank you Sapolsky. for that. Yeah, Sapolsky. I wanted to know if you were aware of him or not and what you thought of him. Uh, I think you're on mute, uh, Lucy. No, I, I do know him. I, I, I read that book a few years ago. Um, yeah. Uh, and I've, I've listened to a lot of his uh, podcasts. I mean, he, I love that guy. Yeah. Oh, Sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, and, and he's a little terrifying to look at, but, you know. But, yeah, he's, he's, yeah he's, he's not a fashion plate, but, uh, but no, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant guy. And uh, no, I love him. What, what were you wanting to ask about him? Well, I wanted to know if you were aware of him and oh, yeah. since, since he was both a neuroscientist and a primatologist and what you thought of his uh, Oh, he's great. He's argument. Great. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's so solid. And, and I mean, and he's, and he's, he knows about so much. I mean, I mean, I was, I remember at one point I was trying to understand complex systems and, you know, he gives a great couple of lectures on that. And that's uh -huh. a hard topic. That's all. Yeah, yeah. The book wasn't the easiest. The appendix was much better, and it was as long as the book. And now yeah. that I've re read the appendix, I want to go back and read the book in no. the first part. Um, I'm not sure how much of it I remember. I liked it when I was reading it, but you know, it, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. You're on mute now. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. there. There yeah. we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. Um. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask one 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 topic to about one topic that we kept aside, okay. and about the concept of self uh, that both Jock have and uh, Damasio. So what 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 do you think about that? Well, Damasio and Jock both feel that if you if you have an emotion, there's got to be somebody who has it. If you have an affect, it's got to be somebody who has it. So they have they have. Um, stipulated, or they have hypothesized that there's certain there's certain subcortical structures. They don't know exactly which they are. They kind of make guesses, best you know, educated guesses, all around the same area, brainstem area. That this would be the self that does the experiencing. There's no it, there's no evidence that that's true, and you know. You know, uh, I don't know if you, 
you know, the Descartes sort of, I think, therefore I am. One of the things that these nitpicking philosophers, I was a philosophy major for my sins. And, um, and one of the things they said, oh, yes, no, you can only say that thinking exists. They say that I am doing thinking is unsubstantiated. You just feel like saying, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> enough. But there is an interesting, there is an interesting uh, branch of science. I don't know. A lot of people, there's been, it's, a lot of people are interested in, a lot of people think it's bunk. I don't know. The guys who are interested in, I can tell you, are smart as hell. Mm -hmm. And it's called the in Integrated Information Technology. Mm -hmm. And what it maintains is that all complex systems, animate or inanimate, are conscious, inherently conscious. And they say, don't ask how it becomes conscious, just say it is conscious. You don't say, how does an electron uh, generate a negative charge? It just has a negative charge. And their idea is that any complex system, like your mobile phone, is minimally conscious, is conscious to some extent. A uh, hydrogen atom with three interacting quarks is a little bit conscious. Your brain, with all these trillions of uh, synaptic connections, is very conscious. And then People say, well, that's crazy. What are you saying that inanimate things can be conscious? I said, what is your brain? It's a lump of flesh. It's a lump of flesh. It's a lump of thing that is uh, obeying the laws of physics and it's conscious. So why do you say other things that obey the laws of physics can't be conscious? Well, the minute you say that maybe inanimate objects can be conscious, then the whole idea of a sense of self becomes a little bit more problematic. There's nothing that I've said that is in any way conclusive, not at all. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I don't know. No, I, the thing I like about uh, you. what you're saying is that you're very careful in distinguishing between things that are well-established and things that are not well-established. And yeah, well, you have to be, yeah, otherwise, exactly. you go, otherwise you're just talking politics. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful. All right, uh, Lucy. This was fantastic. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And I've we'll have you back once the book is out, and I will I will reach out to you uh, okay. shortly, and we'll we'll go from there. Uh, thank okay. you very much, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Um, so, folks, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, this is the end of this meetup. I want to tell you that we have got one more meetup coming at at two thirty, which is going to be on romantic art. Tomorrow, we have got a meetup on how language develops, how metaphors build language over time, how you know the metaphors start in kind of bodily observations, a bodily movement, and then they get kind of transferred into uh, conscious uh, concepts. And what is the progression of that? So that's what we'll be talking about at 12 o'clock tomorrow with uh, Brian uh, McCoy. And then at 2.30 tomorrow, we're going to be talking about paradoxes of polymathy. So people who are transdisciplinary, you know, what are the, what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, of that? And what are the various paradoxes that come in in that? So that's what is coming up rest of the weekend. All right, folks. So uh, Lucy, this was just wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You Rikant, next... Can you tell us a little Bye. bit about today's at 2.30? Sure. Um, all right, let me say goodbye to Lucy first. Okay, okay. Sure, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Right. Thank you. <laughs>